Ambulance emergency, what town or suburb? I'm on board a boat, I'm on a heart attack. They are an Australian icon, but these flying doctors are Brits. 22 year old male, pelvis injuries, will be with you in five. He's got a positive pass, he needs to go straight to the operating theatre. Hundreds of medics from the NHS are saving lives down under. It's all a bit scary, isn't it? But she's doing great. Many are flown into action by British pilots. It's a great feeling of satisfaction. Then you can actually say at the end of the day, you actually save somebody's life. Waving us in, waving us in. And some are bringing back home skills learned on the cutting edge of outback medicine. Start with the thoracostomy on this side. Yep. Can you just cycle another blood pressure, please? Today down under, deep in the bush, flying Dr. Chris gives blood to save his patient. Leeches. A bit different to the UK. British medic Andy finds himself dealing with the victim of a gangland hit. Where's the arm? Uh, mate, back there in the bush somewhere. Okay, so we don't know, right? We don't know where the arm is. No. And flight nurse Dom is fighting to save the life of a tiny baby. What we're seeing now is there's a problem with lungs. She's not safe to fly, is essentially what the problem is. It's another sunny day in Sydney, and consultant Dr Chris Cheeseman, once of the NHS and now a flying doctor down under, is mucking in with his crewmates. A bit harder than washing your bike, though. Chris flies on the Care Flight Chopper, Australia's fastest air ambulance, saving lives around its biggest city. But today, Chris and his team are leaving the city behind for the bush. That's what Australians call the two and a half million square miles of their continent that isn't populated. Deep in the forest, a horse rider is lying badly injured. Care Flight 4, air medical control. Uh, Cowboy 4, we're airborne out of Westmead, 5 POV for Central McDonald for the horse incident. OK, this is a Care Flight helicopter. Uh, we're on route to your location for the uh, girl up a horse, I believe. It's Chris's job to talk to the man who made the emergency call. We need a clear area to land approximately 30 metres across and flat. If you can make sure that all livestock is also clear, that would be very helpful. One of the patient's friends rode several miles to a farm to raise the alarm. How you doing there? Yeah, was I speaking to you on the phone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Whereabouts is she exactly? Um, well, a girl came down from the accident and she said like a couple of k's up a horse track. The bad news is that at the end of their flight, there's still a long walk ahead. Almost two miles. And the forest notorious for its blood-sucking leeches. Not to mention venomous spiders and snakes. You okay, mate? Yeah. Emergencies like this present Chris with problems he never faced back in Staffordshire. There are greater challenges with that pre-hospital retrieval work here in Australia. Sometimes it can be many hours before we actually even get to the casualty, let alone get them to hospital. A lot of the time we have to deal with very sick, very critically injured patients and we have them in our care for a lot longer than we would experience in the UK. Jane Newton is a veteran rider. She'd ridden more than 12 miles through dense woodland in the McPherson State Forest when her mount threw her as she tried to cross a creek, then fell and crushed her. Hi there, how are you doing, darling? So when the horse trampled you, yep. it stepped on your back? No, it hit me in the chest. I was standing up. Yep. It jumped, hit me in the chest, and I fell backwards and landed on my back. We rode about... 20 k's to get here yes. and we tried to get them across the creek and then as soon as it happened she just lied there and screamed and we just covered her <laughs> and ran for help. It might be an idea to keep you with the helmet on actually. 
as we try because we've got to, we're going to have to carry you out it's about three k's two and a half k's something like that apart from first aid from friends with whom she was riding the team's patient has not had any medical attention and it's getting dark so any pain at the back of your neck at all no so if i do there no no pain or tenderness no. at all okay you didn't bump your head really as far as you're aware no. just breathe normally love chris has brought his ultrasound machine but its results are inconclusive Move that arm out of the way a little bit. It's getting dark, it's only about 20 minutes from last light, so the best best option here is just to slowly walk her out. It's been done before many times. We, we're professionals and we can do it. So turn on. Three. Ah, ah, Jane is in great pain from a back injury. How serious it is, Chris can't yet tell. Okay. If you drop me, you'll hear about it. Oh no, we will. So good pulse. 93 sinus. Got it? Nice and gentle. Anybody need a rest, say holler out and we'll put down. Okay? She's going to hospital yep. the hard way. Even a lightweight patient like Jane begins to feel heavy after a few hundred yards and it's hard going underfoot. Okay. <coughs> Lower down. Chris, you want to come through and take the high end? What's your footing, guys? A bit slower, maybe? Sorry. It's very scary. Chris realises that one of the local leeches is making a meal of him. That's going good. Exhausting. Leeches. A bit different to the UK. But leeches are a minor danger compared with some of the wildlife Dr Chris has to deal with down under. Got it? Patients have, um, on a number of occasions, come into the emergency department with the live snake that bit them. The one chap who uh, came in with the snake still attached to his foot, still alive and still wriggling. It's pretty unlikely you're going to experience that in the UK. Jane is heading for Sydney's Westmead Hospital at 180 miles an hour. Sorry, made you work, didn't we? <laughs> yes, sir, you were not all that bad. Very good for a pop. Yeah. <laughs> still all this talk of spiders, snakes and leeches. Horses actually injure far more Australians than spiders, snakes, sharks and crocodiles put together. And today's patient is another of their victims. X-rays confirm she has two broken ribs, but thankfully little else. And she's allowed home the following morning. A hundred miles north of Sydney, in the port city of Newcastle, former Royal Naval Officer Kevin Ratcliffe is starting another day as a pilot of the local rescue chopper. It's a job he loves. There's always the satisfaction of knowing you've made a difference. You know, if there are people in distress, it's a great feeling of satisfaction that you did make a difference in the end. And if it was life-threatening, then you can actually say at the end of the day that you actually saved somebody's life. <laughs> I'll just put you on speaker so that everybody can hear what's going on. Right. Yeah, I've got a notified from there, confirmed that he has a uh, severed arm and possibly a severed leg. Right. And, and it's pretty close to Rafferty's Resort itself, is it? Rafferty's Resort. OK, yeah, we can fix that. The team's about to come face to face with the bloodshed that's part of life and death in Australia's criminal underworld, where Harley Davidson motorcycles are the chosen method of transport for local biker gangs. If anyone can save this rider, it's British a &E doctor Andy Stearman, who's familiar with treating the casualties of gangland violence. If you're going to get stabbed and you're going to get shot, the place you end up is the emergency department. So. Um, we probably do have a disproportionate number of people that are involved in um, criminal activities because it's a dangerous thing to do and you tend to end up injured and you end up in the hospital. It doesn't make any difference to how you treat somebody. I think it's there in the back of your mind, but it doesn't make much difference to how you actually treat somebody. The team's patient was riding his Harley Davidson along a rural road when he was knocked off by a car which failed to stop. Hi. All right. So we've got to here. Yeah. Everyone riding a motorbike has come off. He has an amputated only hanging on by a couple of sinews. Yeah. High femur. Yeah. Okay. 
he got an amputated right arm at the elbow as well. Yeah. The bike has lost a lot of blood. He badly needs a transfusion, so that will be Dr. Andy's first priority. Where's the arm? Uh, mate, back there in the bush somewhere. Okay, so we don't know, right? We don't know where the arm is. No. But we've got as much of the leg as we can get, but that's yeah. mutilated. Okay. Are the coppers looking for any limbs? Okay. Sometimes severed limbs can be reattached, but this seems a hopeless case. Open your eyes, mate. Good work. Doctor's going to talk to you now, okay, yeah. matey? How much pain are you in at the minute? He has not kind of one pain. The lack of pain could be a bad sign. The man's life is in the balance. It's not actively going. Yeah. What we'll do. We'll go by air, yep. so if you're happy when they get the stretcher here. It's a 10 minute flight, it's a 30 minute drive. Yep, cool. The faster this man's in A&E, the better. He needs emergency surgery. They're performing what ambulance crews the world over call a scoop and run. I think it's one of those situations where the injury is severe enough for them to want to get to the major trauma centre rather than spend any more time than necessary on the scene or near the scene. So I think that probably the level of activity here reflects a certain amount of urgency to get going, bearing in mind the sort of severed arm and severed leg that this guy suffered. For pilot Kevin, this will be a routine flight, but for Dr Andy, it's a matter of life or death. His patient wouldn't have survived the 30-minute drive. If it's looking good power-wise, I'll keep the climb going rather than just stay here in the hover, so coming left. OK, left 15 if you wish. Right, uh, just was turning gently because I'm at 95. He was relatively stable. His heart rate was very fast. His blood pressure was very low. He wasn't bleeding too much at the time. So what we did is we started him on a blood transfusion to try and replace some of the blood that he'd lost. Hi, Kevin. Uh, I'll just bring in a trauma room. We're only about three minutes out because we scooped to run. He's, they know we're coming, but he's a 53-year-old man with an amputated right arm and amputated right leg. I just want to make sure they've got the surgical registrar there, they, and they need to activate the massive transfusion protocol and have some own leg ready. We gave him a drug um, called trantosamic acid, uh, which has been shown in, in trauma, if you give it to people that are bleeding, is to improve their survival, improve, improve their outcome, and kind of decrease the amount of bleeding that you get from these sort of injuries. Okay, that's great. Okay, we'll see you soon. Hi. Okay, see ya. The biker's being flown back to Newcastle. Fragments of his story are emerging. He's recently been released from prison, and the collision looks like no accident. Slow down. The team's patient will be in an operating theatre in minutes. He survives, but will be severely disabled. Police are yet to make an arrest in his case, but for Dr Andy, Australia remains a safe place to live. I don't think it's more of a gang culture than there is back home. I think it exists in all countries, really, and there's going to be bikey gangs and there's going to be drug dealers wherever. I'm from Brighton, and Brighton Rock is all about the Brighton Mafia, and there's a lot of drug dealers in Brighton, so I think it happens wherever you are, really. Australia is a young country, and it's keen to preserve its two and a half centuries of European history. Grab your guns. Right here. Today, its early days as a British penal colony are being recreated for TV with a real British ex-soldier, Dom Anthony, taking centre stage. I'm currently working on Banished, which is a BBC production uh, set in 1780 of the first convicts and soldiers to arrive in Australia. About six months ago, I was uh, having a coffee in Cronulla and the, there was a talent agency next door which had a A4 sheet of paper up in the window that said tall skinny men who can run wired for extra work and so I walked in and said I think I'm, I'm your man. Londoner Dom was a reservist in the British Army but he hung up his uniform when he moved down under and took a job as a paediatric nurse. We're about to arrive on set. Uh, we need to be very quiet because they're rolling at the moment. His work as an extra is strictly a hobby. His full-time job involves plenty of real-life drama. As a flight nurse with the Newborn and Paediatric Emergency Transport Service, or NETS for short, it's Dom's job to keep some of Australia's sickest babies alive long enough to reach hospital in the big cities. And today's case is going to be complex. We're going to pick up a 36-week gestation baby from Wagga, which is... Uh 
It's south west of Canberra. I anticipate an hour and a half flight. It's almost 300 miles to their patient. Distance is one of Australia's biggest killers. Bit of a long haul out here, guys. Yeah, no worries. It's a pretty nice country out through here. Oh, yeah. The team's patient is clinging to life. Two-day-old Ari's parents are both nurses. In other circumstances, their medical knowledge might have been useful, rather than adding to their worry. Yeah, I guess you could say useful, but then sometimes knowing a little bit much is worse. <laughs> sometimes no knowledge is good knowledge. We're at 6,000 feet above sea level, quite high up through here. Is this kid going to have any altitude requirements? We don't think so. He's got a pneumothorax, but we're going to try and uh, finish our strain in before we leave, so there shouldn't be any problems with altitude. OK. Wagga Wagga has a population of 40,000 with a small hospital, but the team's patient needs intensive care if she's to survive. She'll travel in her own high-tech incubator designed to protect her from the noise and vibration of the chopper. And we've done a good job here. So we'll put the chest drain in and see how the baby is, review, and then probably head up to Canberra. Her parents work in this hospital. Now they'll be accompanying their tiny daughter on a 150-mile flight to specialist care. A pneumothorax is a collapsed lung. Air is trapped under her ribs, preventing her breathing properly. This is a chest drain. Um, so basically what happens is we will put this drain right into the uh, chest, between the uh, chest wall and the lungs. So that's the place where there's a pocket of air there. And now what happens is when you're flying high, the air expands and that might worsen your respiratory distress. So when you put a chest drain, we'll drain the air out and that will make the um, make Ari feel a bit better. And hopefully he, she might not require a bit more support and that may be the only uh, procedure she requires. This is a tricky operation. Ari's age and tiny size are against her. Is it all? Keep on going. With Dom assisting, Ari's lungs are being slowly reinflated. It's rare to have to perform this kind of procedure on a newborn. The Nets team is trained to do it, but that's little comfort for her parents. Probably they're not much changed from what they were. So far, so good. We're just going to see how well it's worked over the next half an hour or so. Essentially going to tell us the oxygen saturations go up and we're able to wean the volume, the percentage of oxygen that we're giving uh, Ari, then we'll know the chest drain's done the trick. As the minutes tick by, it's clear there's a problem. Ari's showing signs of getting worse, not better. Got rid of the pneumothorax. We've had a repeat x-ray and the pneumothorax is gone. So what we're seeing now is there's a problem with the lungs. We've seen on x-ray that there is some fluid in the lungs. She's not safe to fly, is essentially what the problem is. If little Ari doesn't improve, she may be denied the treatment that will save her life. The next hour for her and her parents will be critical. Nearly nine out of 10 Aussies live within 30 miles of a beach. And when the sun shines, which is most of the time, this is where most people want to be down under. From surfing to scuba diving, swimming to sunbathing. Beaches like Bondi are packed from dawn till dusk. And Dr. Charlie Heldreich from Warwickshire is often one of the crowd. I think that the beach is far more integral to the life of most Australians, they all pretty much live around the coastline and um, because of that the high volume of uh, people coming um, particularly at holiday times to the beach um, can cause problems in increased workload for us not only the dangers of the actual beaches themselves people getting caught in rips and potentially near drowning incidents but also car crashes 
Charlie's a flying doctor with the ambulance service of New South Wales, crewing the fleet of rescue choppers that covers the coast around Sydney. And yeah. Stuart, the paramedic. Yeah, go, go ahead. Yes, sir, in the AD, person trapped in the car. Today, Charlie's on a very different trip to the seaside. I rescue two for um, was over the landing site for you, organised at uh, Ball Hill. Two four copy tower. Is that an ETA over here? Time uh, one two three zero. Over. Rescue two four has been scrambled to the coastal highway south of Sydney. A teenager in a car has been badly injured. Australian life sort of focuses very much around the beaches. So you get a large volume of traffic on the roads and that can lead to an increased number of accidents that we get called to. And especially at the holiday times there may be uh, problems with drink driving, compounding the issue as well. Rescue 24 is heading south past the surfing beaches to a rendezvous with ground paramedics near a beauty spot called Stanwell Tops. How fast around two minutes? Okay, I've got a clear area down here. I've got an ambulance down there as well. Or is that a pistol whipping? I'm not sure. We haven't got much information at the moment, but we know that we're going to a vehicle that's come off the road with two occupants. Other than that, we don't really know. The coastal road is spectacular, but dangerous. Just okay, look in the windsock, it is a bit of a westerly component. Just on the overshoot, we've got those wires and high trees. This isn't an easy area for the pilots either. It's simply too risky to land near the crash, so the patient will have to be brought to the team. Your patient's a passenger. Yep. She's 19, 18, 19. She's still seated in the passenger seat. They've been hitting in a southerly direction, lost yep. traction, spun around, going off the road and then down embankment. Okay. Charlie's patient's on the way from the accident scene by road. Hi, I'm Charlie, I'm one of the doctors. Charlie, here we have. This is our patient, Tian, she's 18 years old. Yeah. Passenger in the car that hit the two trees, approximately about 70 k's. When they're yeah. The crash could easily have been fatal. Left side of neck pain. Yeah. For Charlie, understanding the impact her patient has experienced is vital. But she's going to have to rely on pictures to assess the likely injuries, as well as the descriptions of fellow medics. The car was actually off the road. It was about a 45 degree angle off uh, an embankment and resting against two large trees. As I say, one tree holding up the car was at the back of the car and the other was over the, pas uh, the patient's door. Well, it's essentially a high mechanism injury, so it's a deceleration injury. So it's what we can't see that we're most concerned about. We're going to take you up to St George just to get checked out. OK, I just need to have a quick look at you first, all right? She initially doesn't appear particularly injured, but looking at the degree of damage to that vehicle, you're going to take her injuries far more seriously. Can you take a big deep breath for me? Because her body will have been exposed to high forces that can cause that degree of damage to the vehicle. We're going to just do one more little bit of scanning just at your chest, and then we're all ready to go, OK? Yeah, I think everything looks fine, but we need to just get you checked out. She's going to use ultrasound to examine her patient's abdomen. It's a luxury few ambulance crews enjoy back in Britain. Big breath for me. And out. Everything's fine, OK? We just need to take you to the hospital to get sort of properly checked out, all right? You never quite know what you're going to get called to, and particularly in this area, it could be anything from a gorge in the Blue Mountains to someone being plucked off some rocks to a car crash like this girl. It's a good feeling to know that you've provided them with good care and that you're taking them to a place where they're going to quickly be assessed and hopefully treated. Charlie's patient, Tien Truong, is concerned for her friend who is the driver. Oh, my friend. Yeah, they're yeah. fine. Honestly, you're the worst. And, and there's hardly anything wrong with you, OK? okay. So, so we're, we're not panicking, OK? okay. Dr Charlie is optimistic her patient has escaped the accident with little more than a chipped tooth, but she'll only relax once TN has undergone scans at St George's Hospital in Sydney. Hello, St George, Public Hospital, I'm speaking. Are we coming to you from Stanwell Tops with a primary patient for your ED? Yeah. And uh, we'll be on your pad at 13.15 if you could let security... Uh, yeah. TN will get care every bit as good as that available under the NHS. But down under, around half of trauma victims opt to be cared for privately. That reduces the demand on state A&Es. 
Well, the similarity between Australia and the UK is that they have an NHS and the healthcare is available um, to everybody. People in Australia are encouraged to have private healthcare um, and you pay additional tax if you don't, unlike the UK, where my experience of it is that the majority of people are seen in the public system. Don't worry, it's all normal. It's what we do just to hand over all the information about you. This is exactly the sort of case Dr Charlie came to Australia to tackle. Many British doctors are here because jobs treating patients outside hospital are rare in the NHS. And she plans to take her expertise home soon. I feel really lucky to have worked in both systems. I've certainly had opportunities in Australia that I may not have got so easily in the UK. I'd be keen to go back and continue to work probably in both systems for periods of time for the rest of my career. Um, just have to see how it goes. On the other side of the dramatic Blue Mountains at a small town hospital, flight nurse Dom Anthony is about to assist Dr James Ibero in a critical procedure. Tiny Ari is fighting for her life. A rare condition is starving her body of oxygen. The NETS team has decided it must take over her breathing. Yellow. OK. They'll anaesthetise her, then insert a tube down her windpipe. Air entry is good. Her oxygen saturations, which is a guide to how well her body's being oxygenated, um, is have improved. Her heart rate is still high and we need to give us a sedation because she's got this tube down her throat which is going to be uncomfortable for her. It's time to fly. Canberra and its intensive care unit is almost two hours away. Right, next leg through to Canberra Hospital is uh, 81 uh, nautical miles, so just under 150 kilometres as the crow flies. We've got to go over some pretty high country, up over the, the mountains, up over Tumut, so lower safe altitude, about 7,700 feet up through there, so there's some big country to cross. The noise and vibration of the chopper robs Dom of his most important diagnostic techniques. A stethoscope is useless and monitoring equipment often misreads. We've got a, a neonatal inbound from Walker for the NICU and our ETA 1655. We're pretty happy with uh, the way that R is going. Uh, we've managed to maintain oxygen levels at a satisfactory level. Her heart rate's been stable, so there's no problems with circulation. The tubes remained in place um, and remained patent. We've had no trouble with the chest strain. So, so far, so good. Dom used to work at London's Great Ormond Street Hospital. There he had all the backup of a national centre of excellence. Now he and Dr James are alone, with Ari's life in their hands. Canberra Hospital is a welcome sight. We took it slowly. She's a near yeah. yeah, That's pretty much standard procedure. Beautiful. It took a while to stabilise her, but I think it would have been the wrong decision to go in and made quick decisions and rushed things. So, yeah, generally I think it was a good job. Um, I think James did an excellent job. <laughs> you, you did an excellent <laughs> job. <laughs> By the time they returned to base, they've flown the equivalent of a journey from Belfast to London and back via Cardiff. After a day like that, no wonder Dom relishes his time off and his part-time job as an 18th century redcoat. I had one job where we were in a rescue chopper and you notice the difference, those things are so quick. Time on set can be quite repetitive, um, it's good fun, but uh, you don't get the same job satisfaction you get from doing a day like today. It's another sunny day in Sydney, 
and consultant Dr. Chris Cheeseman, once of the NHS and now a flying doctor down under, is mucking in with his crewmates. A bit harder than washing me bike, though. Chris flies on the Care Flight Chopper, Australia's fastest air ambulance, saving lives around its biggest city. But today, Chris and his team are leaving the city behind for the bush. That's what Australians call the two and a half million square miles of their continent that isn't populated. Deep in the forest, a horse rider is lying badly injured. Care Flight 4, air medical control. Uh, Care Flight 4, we're airborne out of Westmead, 5 POB for Central McDonald for the horse incident. OK, this is a Care Flight helicopter. Uh, we're on route to your location for the uh, girl off a horse, I believe. It's Chris's job to talk to the man who made the emergency call. We need a clear area to land approximately 30 metres across and flat. If you can make sure that all livestock is also clear, that would be very helpful. One of the patient's friends rode several miles to a farm to raise the alarm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. OK, so this is the side of the creek. Yeah, we're really spooking these horses, but uh, I'm not sure how to avoid them. Waving his head, waving his head. Three o'clock. He used to work at London's Great Ormond Street Hospital. There he had all the backup of a national centre of excellence. Now he and Dr James are alone, with Ari's life in their hands. Canberra Hospital is a welcome sight. We took it slowly. She's a neonate. Yeah. That's pretty much standard procedure. It took a while to stabilise her, but I think it would have been the wrong decision to go in and made quick decisions and rushed things. So, yeah, generally I think it was a good job. Um, I think James did an excellent job. <laughs> you, you did an excellent <laughs> job. <laughs> By the time they returned to base, they've flown the equivalent of a journey from Belfast to London and back via Cardiff. After a day like that, no wonder Dom relishes his time off and his part-time job as an 18th century redcoat. I've had one job with a rescue chopper and you notice the difference. Those things are so quick. Time on set can be quite repetitive. Um, it's good fun, but uh, you don't get the same job satisfaction you get from doing a day like today. over some pretty high country, up over the, the mountains, up over Tumut, so lower safe altitude, about 7,700 feet up through there, so there's some big country to cross. The noise and vibration of the chopper robs Dom of his most important diagnostic techniques. A stethoscope is useless and monitoring equipment often misreads. We've got a, a neonatal inbound from Walker for the NICU and our ETA 1655. We're pretty happy with uh, the way that Ari's going. Uh, we've managed to maintain oxygen levels at a satisfactory level. Her heart rate's been stable, so there's no problems with circulation. The tubes remained in place um, and remained patent. We've had no trouble with the chest strain. So, so far, so good. Dom used to work at London's Great Ormond Street Hospital. There he had all the backup of a national centre of excellence. Now he and Dr James are alone, with Ari's life in their hands. Canberra Hospital is a welcome sight. We took it slowly. She's a neonate. That's pretty much standard procedure. It took a while to stabilise her, but I think it would have been the wrong decision to go in and made quick decisions and rushed things. So, yeah, generally I think it was a... Marie's age and tiny size are against her. Is more? Is that all? Or... I can, I can. Yeah, let's keep on going. With Dom assisting, Ari's lungs are being slowly reinflated. It's rare to have to perform this kind of procedure on a newborn. The Nets team is trained to do it, but that's little comfort for her parents. Probably they're not much changed from what they were. So far, so good. We're just going to 
see how well it's worked over the next half an hour or so. It's essentially going to tell us if the oxygen saturations go up and we're able to wean the volume, the percentage of oxygen that we're giving uh, Ari, then we'll know the chest drain's done the trick. As the minutes tick by, it's clear there's a problem. Ari's showing signs of getting worse, not better. Got rid of the pneumothorax. We've had a repeat x-ray and the pneumothorax is gone. So what we're seeing now is there's a problem with the lungs. We've seen on x-ray that there is some fluid in the lungs. She's not safe to fly, is essentially what the problem is. If little Ari doesn't improve, she may be denied the treatment that will save her life. The next hour for her and her parents will be critical. What's your footing, guys? A bit slower, maybe? Sorry. It's very scary. Chris realises that one of the local leeches is making a meal of him. That's going good. Exhausting. Leeches. Bit different to the UK. But leeches are a minor danger compared with some of the wildlife Dr. Chris has to deal with down under. Got it? Patients have, um, on a number of occasions, come into the emergency department with the live snake that bit them. But one chap who uh, came in with the snake still attached to his foot, still alive and still wriggling. It's pretty unlikely you're going to experience that in the UK. Jane is heading for Sydney's Westmead Hospital at 180 miles an hour. Sorry, made you work, didn't we? <laughs> yes, sir, you were not all that bad. Very good for a pop. Yeah. <laughs> Still all this talk of spiders, snakes and leeches. Horses actually injure far more Australians than spiders, snakes, sharks and crocodiles put together. And today's patient is another of their victims. X-rays confirm she has two broken ribs, but thankfully little else, and she's allowed home the following morning. A hundred miles north of Sydney, in the port city of Newcastle, former Royal Naval officer Kevin Ratcliffe is starting another day as a pilot of the local rescue chopper. Results are inconclusive. Move that arm out of the way a little bit. It's getting dark, it's only about 20 minutes from last light, so the best, best option here is just to slowly walk her out. It's been done before many times. We, we're professionals and we can do it. So. Turn it on. Three. Ah, ah, Sorry. Ah. Jane is in great pain from a back injury. How serious it is, Chris can't yet tell. Okay. If you drop me, you'll hear about it. Oh, I know. We will. <laughs> so, good pulse. 93 sinus. Got it? Nice and gentle. Anybody need a rest? Say holler out and we'll put down, okay? She's going to hospital yep. the hard way. Even a lightweight patient like Jane begins to feel heavy after a few hundred yards, and it's hard going underfoot. Okay. <coughs> Lower down. Chris, you want to come through and take the high end? What's your footing, guys? A bit slower, maybe? Sorry. It's very scary. Chris realises that one of the local leeches is making a meal of him. That's going good. Exhausting. Leeches. Bit different to the UK. But leeches are a minor danger compared with some of the wildlife Dr. Chris has to deal with down under. Got it? Patients have, um, on a number of occasions, come into the emergency department with the live snake that bit them. No leech. We're at 6,000 feet above sea level, quite high up through here. Is this kid going to have any re altitude requirement? We don't think so. He's got a pneumothorax, but we're going to try and uh, put a chest straight in before we leave, so there shouldn't be any problems with the altitude. Okay. Wagga Wagga has a population of 40,000 with a small hospital. But the team's patient needs intensive care if she's to survive. She'll travel in her own high-tech incubator designed to protect her from the noise and vibration of the chopper. And we've done a good job here. So we'll put the chest drain in and see how the baby is, review, and then probably head up to Canberra. Her parents work in this hospital. Now they'll be accompanying their tiny daughter on a 150-mile flight to specialist care. A pneumothorax is a collapsed lung. 
Air is trapped under her ribs, preventing her breathing properly. This is a chest drain. Um, so basically what happens is we will put this drain right into the uh, chest, between the uh, chest wall and the lungs. So that's the place where there's a pocket of air there. And now what happens is when you're flying high, the air expands and that might worsen your respiratory distress. So when it's patient 10, she's 18 years old. Yeah. Passenger in the car that hit the two trees, approximately about 70 k's. When they're yeah. The crash could easily have been fatal. Left side of neck pain. Yeah. For Charlie, understanding the impact her patient has experienced is vital. But she's going to have to rely on pictures to assess the likely injuries, as well as the descriptions of fellow medics. The car was actually off the road. It was about a 45 degree angle off uh, an embankment and resting against two large trees. As I say, one tree holding up the car was at the back of the car and the other was over the, uh, the patient's door. Well, it's essentially a high mechanism injury, so it's a deceleration injury. So it's what we can't see that we're most concerned about. We're going to take you off up to St George just to get checked out. Okay, I just need to have a quick look at you first, all right? She initially doesn't appear particularly injured, but looking at the degree of damage to that vehicle, you're going to take her injuries far more seriously. Can you take a big deep breath for me? Because her body will have been exposed to high forces that could cause that degree of damage to the vehicle. We're going to just do one more little bit of scanning just at your chest, and then we're all ready to go, OK? Yeah, I think everything looks fine, but we need to just get you checked out. She's going to use ultrasound to examine her patient's abdomen. It's a luxury few ambulance crews enjoy back in Britain. Big breath for me. And out. 